Chapter 17 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington. Chapter 17 Crystal Gazing and Shell Hearing. Crystal gazing means, simply, the practice of looking into a ball of crystal, glass or some similar substance, and endeavoring to see within it pictures or images which apparently present themselves to the eye, while thus gazing at it. Crystal gazing is very ancient. The Egyptians used it in their practices of divination, and, throughout ancient history, we find traces of this magical art. In the Middle Ages it was revived, especially by the learned Dr. D., who lived in the reign of Queen Elizabeth in England, and who employed a seer, or scryer, by the name of Kelly. Dr. D. wrote a book on his researches, which work is now classical. In more recent times, crystal gazing has been made a subject of special study by the Psychical Research Society, and several books may now be had upon the question. It is a very simple, and at the same time, one of the safest means of psychic development. It is not necessary, as a matter of fact, to employ a crystal, or even a glass ball, particularly if you are a good subject. But it would greatly help matters if you did possess one, and we should advise the student to procure one, if possible, and use this for purposes of experimentation. How to begin. The best way to begin is to procure a crystal of at least three inches in diameter, larger if possible, and mount it upon a slender wooden stand. The stand and crystal should be placed against a background of black felt or cloth, and the crystal should be shaded with more cloth of the same character, so that there is no highlight anywhere upon it, that is, no point upon which the sun's rays fall, making it a bright spot. If the outlines of the ball appear a little cloudy and uncertain, owing to the semi-darkness, this will often help matters. Place yourself in front of the ball, your eyes being about a foot from its surface. You should be seated in a comfortable chair, your eyes shaded from the light, and relaxed in body and quiet in mind. Gaze steadily at the crystal for a few minutes. Do not strain or focus the eyes particularly upon any part of the ball, or try to see into its interior. Do not blink the eyes more than you can help. At the same time, do not strain them by trying to keep them open for any length of time without blinking. Do not let your eyes wander from the ball, nor your attention relax from the subject in hand. Do not let your eyes stare vacantly, but look intently at the ball without undue strain or concentration. Try not to think of anything in particular during the process of this gazing. Make the mind fairly blank. At the same time, do not allow yourself to become sleepy or the mind to become totally blank to outside impressions. It is inadvisable to keep this up for more than five minutes at a time at first, for if you do you will find that your eyes will become strained and will water after you leave off the experiment. If this is the case, you may be sure you have continued gazing for too long a period. As in automatic writing, it is advisable, if possible, to sit at the same time every day, while developing, and for the same length of time each day. This time may be lengthened as you progress, though it is usually found unnecessary to look into the crystal for more than a few minutes at a time, for you cannot get consistent, long-drawn-out visions as you can automatic writing. Explanation of Crystal Gazing Crystal gazing depends largely upon the ability possessed by the psychic to visualize, or express in pictorial form, thoughts and images which arise from the subconscious mind. The majority of crystal visions are of this character. You must not assume that because you see figures in the ball, that these figures are really in that place, that is, that they are objective or external and exist within the crystal. No, they are mental pictures, or hallucinations, but they are expressed or externalized in this way. For example, you may think of a friend's face and bring it up vividly before your mind's eye as a memory picture. Now, in ordinary life, the process of externalization ends there. But if you are a good visualizer, you can carry it further and actually project into the crystal the picture of your thought, placing it in the ball, where you will see your friend's face clearly reflected from within its depths. But your friend is not really in the ball. It is merely your mental conception or picture of him. Nearly all crystal visions are of this character, as before said. Supernormal Crystal Visions 
Crystal visions, however, often contain information and messages which the sitter could not possibly have known normally, and which are conveyed to him by this means. For instance, you may look into the ball one day, and see, acted before you in the crystal vision, a tragedy in which some friend of yours plays a part. You know nothing whatever about this, yet later on you receive from this friend a letter, telling you of the details of the tragedy in question. Your vision has proved correct. It is authentic and supernormal in character. Thus you will see that crystal visions are more than mere empty visions or hallucinations. The character and content of these pictures often convey striking information, and they may be telepathic, clairvoyant, or premonitory, just as dreams are. Or they may represent genuine spirit messages conveyed from some deceased friend or relative. It is no unknown thing to see words written in the ball as though you were reading handwriting. A friend of mine once looked into her crystal ball and saw within it a newspaper notice of the death of her dearest friend. She was totally ignorant of the fact, and only learned it later on. This same lady, who is a writer, has the power of projecting or placing in the crystal, at will, figures or scenes which she conjures up before her, and when they are in the ball, they will continue acting out the parts assigned to them, just as they would in a dream, for the figures seen in the crystal are not inert and motionless, but move about and appear to have life and motion of their own. On many occasions when this lady placed the characters of a novel she was writing into the crystal by an effort of will, she was enabled to see them there, and they frequently enacted certain scenes which gave her a good idea for the continuation of the plot of the story. In such a case, you will see, crystal gazing performed a very useful and practical service. How to develop the power. You may develop the power of visualizing in yourself, which is extremely important, by such simple imagination exercises as the following. Ask yourself a question such as, What was the color of Mother Hubbard's dog? Was Jack the giant killer dark or fair? Was Helen of Troy tall or small and slender? Such questions as these should bring up before your mind's eye an immediate answer in the form of a mental picture of the person or event in question and if they do not do so, you may be sure that your power of visualizing is not good and will have to be developed before you can have clear crystal visions. If your power of visualizing is extremely good, you will probably be enabled, after a certain length of time, to dispense with the ball altogether and see your visions upon a white or black background by concentrating upon it, and finally anywhere in space that you may choose to induce them. When you have arrived at this stage of development, however, you are very far along the path of successful mediumship. Clouding and Visualization If you are to obtain crystal visions, you will probably notice that, just before the vision appears, the ball will cloud over as though a blackish-gray mist were filling it, or were interposed between your eyes and it. This clouding, as it is called, is well known, and is a symptom of oncoming visions. If after sitting for five minutes every day for a couple of weeks, you do not obtain any visions at all, you may rest assured that you are a very poor visualizer and will probably not succeed in this direction. You might try, however, one simple experiment for a few days longer. Gaze at a bright and highly colored object upon which the light is falling for about a minute. Then close your eyes for a few seconds and then look at the ball. If you are ever to see anything, you should, after a few attempts, see within the ball a duplicate of the object you have been looking at in its complementary colors. It is asserted by a certain school of occultists that the visions seen within the crystal are not invariably subjective or hallucinatory, but are real entities, and that the figures have an independent existence apart from the seer. This, however, is a complicated question which is unsuitable for a primary book of instruction upon psychic development, such as the present. It will therefore be omitted from consideration with this brief mention. Shell Hearing if you place to your ear two large conch shells, you will hear a peculiar rushing or roaring sound as of the sea in the far distance. This is only natural, and probably due to the air within its cavities and the resounding properties of the various curves of the shell. So far all is simple enough, but many persons, who are slightly psychic, as soon as they place the shells to their ears, hear distinct and characteristic sounds, usually in the form of whispered or spoken words. These words may be inarticulate, they may be incoherent like dreams. They may repeat your own name time after time. Or they may convey systematic and definite messages. 
as in the case of crystal gazing dreams and automatic writing shell hearing is a method of externalizing or expressing in outward form the thoughts and auditory messages of the subconscious mind but they may be more than this they may at times embody telepathic clairvoyant or premonitory messages or they may represent genuine spirit communication it all depends on the content of the message and upon the character of the words spoken just as in planchette writing if you obtain a jumble of nonsense you may be sure that it is the product of your own subconscious activity but if you obtain a characteristic and direct message you may have reason to believe it emanates from the friend it purports to proceed from in shell hearing it is the same important warnings and advice if the messages are nonsensical they should be disregarded if on the other hand they are interesting clear-cut and are proved to be correct you should regard them as possibly genuine mediumistic messages and they should be judged and valued by you accordingly in all cases of this character here as elsewhere you must use your own critical judgment and common sense upon the messages you receive shell hearing is certainly one of the clearest at the same time one of the most pleasant methods of receiving communications that can be employed the voices which you hear may be recognizable or unrecognizable it is the former that are a good proof of authenticity they may develop by themselves or emerge from a confused babble of sound unrecognized voices will often utter warnings or convey information of this character human voices are not always heard in the shell but occasional musical and other sounds which cannot easily be described finally an important warning should be heeded if after discontinuing shell hearing you continue to hear voices you should immediately drop all experiments for some days as this phenomenon of insistent voices is one of the first symptoms of danger as long as the manifestations are well controlled you may feel that you are on the safe road and developing as you should but if they begin to get beyond your control you should stop shell hearing for some time until you have strengthened your inner self to such an extent that you think it advisable to continue experimenting again in this direction. End of chapter 17. Recording by Amanda Friday.